and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. The angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. There had to be a reason why that star rose in the east and why the great men followed it to worship at a baby's feet. There had to be a reason why the angels sang that day. There had to be a reason why the shepherds knelt to pray, they knelt to pray. There had to be a reason for those ancient prophecies. He'd be called Wonderful Counselor, he'd be called the Prince of Peace. There had to be a reason there before the world began. He decides to leave his home above and to live here as a man, as a man. There had to be a reason and the darkness had to flee. He would in the reign of death become the light the world could see. There had to be a reason for that cross they led him to. There had to be a reason and that reason it was you, he came for you. There had to be a reason why that star rose in the east. Thank you, Kevin. And I just want to say, Kevin just wrote that song in the church last week. He just wrote it. He just wrote that. Whoa. Well, wow. Thank you, Kevin. Double thanks. Man. And thank you, Beverly and Brenda, for leading us in worship. Well, our text for this Christmas Day is John chapter 1. 1 through 18. And this will be telling us the reason that the star rose in the east. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. 
He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to that light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh. The title of our sermon today. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling uh, uh, among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one's ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is Himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made Him known. And now, Father, we ask that You would bless these next few minutes we have together, that we might hear, understand, believe, and commit ourselves to the Word. Amen. I think that most of you have heard my testimony. I don't have time to give it all today, but I want to just kind of outline it for you. On August the 29th, 1980, something happened to me which radically changed my life. That day marked the end of a two-year struggle that had virtually destroyed my life. For some time prior to that date, I had been relaxing in the comfort of a successful law career, a picture-perfect family, and a wealth of friends and social acquaintances. During the course of that two-year period of time, my eight-year-old daughter was killed uh, in an accident. Uh, two years to the date after that, my best friend died suddenly without any warning at all. And two months following that, my first wife divorced me. Rather suddenly, my success and comfort was turned to near unbearable grief, despair, and hopelessness. But on that day, August the 29th, 1980, through the witness of a friend, God intervened in my situation and miraculously changed my life. The circumstances did not change. My daughter was still dead. My best friend was still dead. I was divorced, but somehow I gained courage and strength to deal with them effectively and felt a sense of peace and joy in spite of it all. That experience raised many questions in my mind about God and church. My image of God had always been omnipotent creator, but God's omnipotence in my mind belonged to another world and made little difference in my life. God was up in the heaven somewhere in the sweet by and by, and I was down here on the earth living in the nasty now and now. Church was dull and boring. It seemed to me nothing more than an institution of human invention. By contrast, the God I began to experience after that day and I continued to encounter uh, in the present 
is a God of present power who has healed me of many deep hurts and has set me free from many destructive habits that were draining me of hope, life, and joy. Worship services suddenly became rather exciting to me. Uh, the church became the center of my non-work activity and obviously later became my work. <laughs> what was the difference? Why had I not found this life-changing power before? I was a believer. I walked the aisle at Main Street Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida when I was nine years old by myself, nobody else, on a Sunday night service. And I knelt at that altar and that preacher prayed with me. And God forgave my sin. And I knew I had a home in heaven. And I always believed that. But I haven't, didn't find life-changing power as I grew and matured in my faith. Now surely there are a number of factors uh, involved in how one grows in their faith and prospers in the faith. But I believe the main factor is that the faith that I had before was devoid of experience. I had not experienced God. And there is no way to experience God, you see, when he's way up there and I'm way down here. John Wesley, who is the founder of Methodism, uh, once received a letter from a friend asking him about a mutual acquaintance that lived in Wesley's town. He lived in London. And the letter read about this person, I hear he now has the knowledge of religion. When we Wesley replied to the letter, he wrote these words, Indeed, he has the knowledge of religion. May God now give him the experience of it. The experience of it. Wesley knew that religion without experience is not effective in producing substantive, lasting change in human life. Now my problem was my image of God was pre Christmas, you can believe that. I mean, how, how could I do that in the, I guess this, that was the 1950s, early 50s. No, it probably been late 40s. Uh, the, but it was pre-Christmas. He was the God out there rather than the incarnate God of the New Testament. He was not the Word made flesh in Jesus Christ. He was not the God who entered and remains in the course of human history, who makes his power available to us to transform our lives and bring about change in the world. Until we understand that concept, God is just an abstract thought in our minds. The almighty, incomprehensible being who lives up in the cloud somewhere. Christmas is God becoming actual. The eternal word became flesh and entered the dimension of human experience and history. This is an incredible thing God has done. As he does so well, C.S. Lewis gets it really down to our level. He said the second person in the Holy Trinity, the Son, became human himself, was born into the world as an actual man, a real man of particular height, with hair of a particular color, speaking a particular language, weighing so many pounds. The eternal being who knows everything and who created the whole universe, became not only a man, but before that a baby, and before that a fetus inside a woman's body. If you want to get the hang of it, think what it would be like for you to become a slug or a crab. Why? 
did God do this incredible thing? Well, you say God did it to reveal himself to us or to reveal the beauty and nobility of humanity untarnished by sin. Well, both of those are true. But they are the results of his coming, the consequences of his coming, not the purpose. The New Testament is clear that the grand reason why Jesus came was redemption. In John 12, 27, Jesus, speaking of his impending death, said, Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus was born to die. Jesus was born to die for our redemption. Amen. What is redemption? It's recovering ownership of something by paying a required price. That's how it's defined. Redemption implies preceding bondage of some sort. The Bible tells us that we are born into the bondage and curse of sin and death. That was what was draining me of life and hope. We are in bondage to death because we sin. We transgress God's law. We have no power within us to stop it. Jesus came to redeem us from that curse. Oswald Chambers once wrote these words. The incredible claim of Jesus Christ is that he has power to reproduce himself by regeneration, to introduce into us his own heredity so that the dust of the ground will again have the breath of God to give it life. God incarnate in human flesh waded straightway into the mire of sin and death and hell and cleared a path for us back to God where we could stand before his majesty and glory as we were created to do as friends and lovers of God. The eternal word the creator of all things, became the weakest thing in creation, a little baby. So majestically small, most of the world never saw him. In fact, sadly today, still, many in the world cannot see him, do not see him. God used that baby to redeem us from the power of sin and to give us his heredity. God looked around somewhere for Jesus to be born. Where was it? In Bethlehem. But you see, he's still looking around. Amen. He wants your heart to be a Bethlehem. Amen. He wants Jesus to be born in you. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. With that righteousness comes the power of God, so that even the, even the weakest one among us can become more than a conqueror. That's the promise of God's word. Paul wrote these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. If only... For this life, we have hope in Christ. We are to be pitied more than all men. Now, Paul was trying to get the church of his time to remember 
that the ultimate purpose of God and thus the foundation of our life is the future reconciliation of all things to God to that place we call heaven or eternal life. It seems the first century church was so focused on the present life and what God was doing among them. That miracles were happening, incredible things happening. They, weren't, they didn't give any attention at all to eternal life. Well, I think the church in Wesley's day had done just the opposite. And I think that's the way the church in America is today. We focus so much on the forgiveness of sin and eternal life in heaven, we lose sight of the revelation that God is a present and a practical reality in the life that we live today. And He is Emmanuel, God with us. Not only with us, but in us. The eternal Word of God became flesh in Jesus Christ. When Jesus went back to heaven, the Spirit of God was poured out on all flesh on the day of Pentecost. God is not out there somewhere. He lives with us and is in us. To all who received him, the text said, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God by the Spirit of God. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of God? The dwelling place of God. That means that God is in this very room. Think about that. Last night, Kevin sang uh, that wonderful song, Mary, Did You Know? And every time I think of that song, I remember the first time I heard it. I think we were singing it in a choir in, at Gateway. And I, and I read those words. Mary, did you know, when you kissed your little baby, you kissed the face of God. But listen, God is in this very room. God can be experienced. You can know in your heart that God is with you. If we could just get hold of that one truth and believe it, or better, let that truth get hold of us, it changes everything. It changes us. It changed me and countless millions of others who will give their testimony that since I met Jesus, Things have changed. Things are different. Would you pray with me, please?